Welcome to this service from the Aberdeen Churches of the West End and City Centre for Sunday the 28th of June. Whether you are joining us online or on the phone, from Aberdeen or further afield, we are delighted to worship with you. As we gather virtually, we remember that in the mysteries of life, God meets us. In trying to make sense of what we don't understand, God is enough. In the sadness of our grief, God is there for us. In the joy and the laughter, God celebrates with us. Come, let us worship God who meets us where we are. Let us worship Jesus who knows and understands us. Let us worship the Spirit who helps us in our need. Let us pray. Loving God, the beauty of your creation which surrounds us, the splendours of your earth, the order and richness of nature all speak to us of your glory. The coming of your Son, the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives, the fellowship of your church, even in times of lockdown. All of this shows the marvel of your love. So we come before you this day to worship you and adore you, God of grace and glory. Loving God, as we come before you, we acknowledge our failings and our shortcomings and we confess our sins. We confess how we forget to love and serve you, how at times we wander from your ways, and how so often we can be careless of your world and put its future in danger. When we talk with words of concern, but fail to match our words with actions, have mercy upon us, Lord. When we fail to fulfil the calling that you have placed upon our lives and reflect your love in and through all that we do, have mercy upon us, Lord. Forgive us all our sins, and as we are forgiven, help us to reflect that same spirit of love and forgiveness in and through our lives in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Dear folks, it's quite a challenge uh, recording some of these parts for the service. I thought it would be nice to read not quite the word out on the street, but at least in the back garden close to the back lane. And of course the bin lorry arrived and there was a fair bit of noise. So here's hoping this time it's reasonably quiet. Let us listen for the word of God. We read from the book of Genesis, chapter 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship 
and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld me from your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Amen, and may God bless to us the reading and hearing of his word. I'm told that there's a Yiddish folk tale that goes something like this. Why didn't God send an angel to tell Abraham to sacrifice Isaac rather than go himself? Because God knew that no angel would undertake such a task. Instead, the angel said to God, if you want to command death, you go and do it yourself. There's no way to talk about this passage except to deal first with the elephant in the room. What kind of God commands a parent sacrifice their child? If the thought offends you, then you're in good company. Preachers like this one have been tying themselves up in knots probably since this story was first told. The answer to this fair question would be no God that any of us would care to know. But we needn't worry, as this is a story, a story about faith, a story about the spiritual search, and yes, a story about God. But it is a theological narrative whose purpose is to help us think more clearly about our own lives of faith and what it means. And in that regard, it's like any other story that makes us think. It employs the most extreme circumstances. And the narrative features a conflict of motives, a discombobulating storyline, and gradual but building suspense. And frankly, that's the tool of any good storyteller. It's not history. No one actually gets killed. So I suggest that we can breathe a sigh of relief and delve a bit deeper into the story and see what the Spirit of God might be trying to say to us through it. In many ways, the story follows the pattern of Abraham's first call in Genesis. God calls Abraham to leave his people, his country, and go to a new land, a land of promise. But it's a place he's never seen or known of. All he has to go on is this sense of call, the call of God on his life. The promise to this elderly, childless couple is great. Abraham will be the father to a great nation. So many descendants will he have that they will be more numerous than the stars in the sky. Yes, that's right, to an old, childless couple. Yet the story progresses. The promise is repeated. And despite a good laugh at the very thought, Sarah gives birth to Isaac, the child of promise. Against all the odds in the world, God keeps his promise. A child is born, a dynasty begun, and now, unbelievably, incomprehensibly, this same God asks for the sacrifice of the child. 
It's an impossible demand, of course, and there's no point us trying to reconcile ourselves to it. What may also flummox us as readers is that the storyteller tells nothing of the Abraham's feelings, which almost makes it worse. There are no words of resistance or hints of self-doubt, never mind angst on his part. Abraham only responds in the story to the words of other people, and always with the same answer, here I am. This is the radical obedience of someone who knows that their life is not their own. The action of someone who understands that their life takes place on a much larger landscape of which they have no knowledge or control. God is God. Abraham is Abraham. If God has given the promise, God can take it away. Yet so much of this is unacceptable for us as modern readers. Apart from the obvious horror at the idea of child sacrifice, beyond that, the dark command of God in this story seems at complete odds with the God of promise. Why would God be so fickle and so cruel to take that promise away? The answer lies in Abraham's words to Isaac's question, where is the burnt offering? Abraham replies, God will provide. Is this what Abraham knew or had faith in? Was this the point of the test? That however little Abraham could understand the impossible horror of the situation, it was a test of his faith in God to keep his promise and to be faithful? And if so, what might all this have to say for our lives of faith today? I want us to focus on two attributes of God in the story. Attributes which the dramatic nature of the storyline tries to sh throw into sharp relief for us. In his landmark commentary on the book of Genesis, Walter Brueggemann, one of the finest Old Testament scholars of our time, pretends that the character of God in this story is that God is on one hand the one who tests us and on the other, the one who provides for us. The drama of the storyline may be too much for some of us, but the point remains that the ancient writers of this story of faith knew this tension in their own lives and understanding of God. That on one hand, God is the divine other who keeps the promise, and on the other, God is the one who demands radical obedience at times from us. So in that sense, God is the one who both gives, but who also takes away. The one who loves, and yet the one who makes demands. The one whose call to us is above all other things. And if this demanding God seems a little too much for us, we can't take comfort either from the fact that this God is found in the Old Testament, because he or she also permeates the new. Think of the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, and specifically of the lines, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In other words, God, do not be the one who tests us with all kinds of temptation that might draw us away from you, but rather be the one who delivers us from our propensity to take the path of evil. As Brueggemann puts it, the prayer is the petition that our situation of faith may not be so urgent that we will be found out. Friends, the Lord's prayer speaks the fear that if we are tested, we may well be found wanting. The author of Genesis is reminding us, people of faith in our own time, followers of Jesus, of the radical claim of God that is on all of our lives. The God whose presence on one hand is a blessing and a promise to us, and on the other hand, whose presence calls us beyond ourselves to radical obedience and a different way of life in the world. If this seems a touch dramatic, then it's because it is. 
If we have encountered the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, the God of Jesus, it does not leave us unaffected or unchanged. All is changed. The German Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer knew this for himself and in the context of Nazi Germany knew the cost of discipleship for himself. Indeed, he wrote a book of that very name. He and the Protestant resistance, along with many Christians throughout history who have resisted evil in its most awful forms, knew the radical call of obedience to the way of Jesus and knew what the cost could be. There is something about crisis and the crucible of extreme circumstance that focuses our human minds and sharpens our moral character. Bonhoeffer and his compatriots were faced with such overwhelming evil that it made the choice they faced very clear. But of course, it highlighted the possible cost too. Bonhoeffer was understandably critical of a civil, pious Christianity that in reality was weak and limp in the face of clear injustice and terror in the world. And Bonhoeffer looked out at much of the Christianity of his time, which had been so ineffective in the minds and hearts of his own people, so much so the Nazis had risen to power. It was, in his mind, a Christianity that cost no one anything, made no demand of anyone, and that was deaf to the radical call of the God of the Bible. He summed up this kind of weak Christianity as cheap grace, in contrast to the very costly grace of the Gospels. Bonhoeffer writes, Costly grace is the Gospel which must be sought again and again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which someone must knock. And such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it can cost us our life, and it is grace because it gives the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin, and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. You were bought at a price. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. I wonder, in a world where we witness ever more the extremes of poverty and extremes of wealth, in a world where black lives often do not seem to matter as much as those who are white, in a world where children are trafficked and people held in modern slavery, even in our own country, I wonder, actually, if we need more of the God who makes demands of us, who puts us to the test. The God who demands justice and righteousness of us. I wonder if in our comfort and complacency, we do not need the God who puts us to the tests, test and asks something of us, not of others, but of us. So committed was Jesus to the kingdom of God, to a community where there was radical inclusion, justice and reconciliation, that he was prepared to take the heat for what he believed in. And then, of course, as Bonhoeffer reminds us, even to suffer and die. In response to the call of God, the question is, what does our discipleship cost us? Has discipleship cost us much? if anything. If it's a radical act of faith to believe in a God who tests us, then it's also an act of radical faith to believe in a God who provides for us. In a world beset by humanism, scientism and naturalism, to say that God will provide in a way is just as scandalous. As Abraham is tested, so he is provided for. As we pray in the Lord's Prayer for help when we are tested, so we also give thanks for our bread each day. The challenge of faith is one of trust, 
to trust that we will be given what we need, not always what we desire, but what we need for each day. The challenge is to live a life of trust in the faithfulness of God to be all the source of our sustenance and life. Naturally, we place our trust in all kinds of things, markets, governments, people, people whom we love, people we like, people whose ideas and way of thinking resonates with us. Fortunately, few of us will be challenged in the way Bonhoeffer was. It's astonishing to me that in his letters and papers from prison, he displays so much faith and reliance in God in the face of such abject suffering. But what reliance on the providence and grace of God does is to free us up to leave reliance on the false gods of money, wealth, privilege, that in the end are nothing but false idols. Friends, in the face of this God, who both challenges us and provides for us, the lesson for us is this. God provides. God is faithful. Whatever your experience this day, whatever your worries or your joys are, know that you're not alone. If you're trying to change something for the better, to heal a broken relationship or work for something that is good but difficult, you are not on your own. God is there with you. If you're suffering loss or struggling with changed circumstance, if life seems to be on top of you just now, you're not on your own. God is there with you. The pathway of faith is demanding. It can be difficult. But God is faithful. God is love.
Let's pray together. Loving and sustaining God, you call us to obedience, to follow you in all things, to give up the things we cling to, and to give ourselves wholeheartedly to your purposes. We confess that we don't always find this easy to do. We confess that it is often very difficult to let go of the things that we love. But we also know that you are enough for us and that you never ask more of us than what is possible and that you stand ready at all times to sustain us and to provide everything we need. Give us courage to faithfully follow your leading, even when we cannot see the outcome, even when the path you call us to seems impossible to comprehend. Help us to trust you in all things, to let go of everything that would stand in the way of wholehearted obedience to you, to really live lives that reflect you are enough, loving God. Compassionate Father, let us not forget our neighbors at this time. Not just those who live close, but in the wider community, those who are elderly, vulnerable, ill, and very much isolated from the world just outside their doors. May they know that they are loved through our, our actions and our care. And in their loneliness, know your presence, your healing, and your peace. Loving God, we give thanks for the extended family of local communities, assisting with the needs of both frail and elderly confined to their homes. May every gift of love, every encouraging word, bring hope into lonely lives and a blessing to the giver. And for all of us, Grant wisdom to make sensible choices, not just for ourselves, but for everybody. Father, in the darker moments when clouds gather and the heaviness we feel sometimes seems overwhelming, remind us of your love, the love that carries the weight of so much on that cross. Remind us how you embrace the world with arms outstretched that we might know freedom from the chains which constrain us. Remind us, all sufficient God, that when we fall, you catch us. When we are sad, you hold us. When we cry, you wipe our tears. When we are broken, you put us back together. Remind us, Father, now and always, that you are more than enough. Amen. And now, as we end our time of worship together, may God provide for you in mercy. May Christ Jesus greet you as you welcome the stranger. And may the Holy Spirit lead you in the ways of sanctification and eternal life, now and always. Amen.